Okay, I'm about to get started here and I wanna welcome everyone. My name is Lamari. I'm the Senior Director of Community Engagement here at the Decentralized Identity Foundation. So you've all found your way here today as part of the ongoing hackathon that we're running between now and December 1st. So there's still plenty of time to form a team, to find a team, to get hacking and also to learn. Um, today, uh, we are joined by Adewala Abati, who is one of the developer advocates for TDD. He will be giving us an introduction to the Web5 SDK and also taking people through a demo. I know there's lots of people who are excited to use Web5 in their hackathon submissions. Um, and the great thing is that we're not restricting people to just one category. If you did want to submit to TBDs, sponsor prize pool, but also submit to the main diff prize pool, you could do that. Um, so if you have not yet, so I'm gonna drop a link in the chat. If you have not yet gone over to our website for this hackathon, please do so. Check out the resources, also register if you have not yet done so. Um, we also have a Discord server. So the Discord server, the, the link is, um, it's on the webpage, but I'm going to drop the direct link here as well. So if you do want to follow up with questions after this session, there is a channel for TVD in our Discord server where you can continue the discussion. And also they're going to, they've set up office hours as well. So I'm sure Adewala will, will share more about that. Uh, so with, um, with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Adewala, who will give you the intro to Web5. Thanks, Lumari. Hello, everyone. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be here today and uh, to get to speak to everyone. Um, my name is Adewale, uh, and I'm, I currently live in Amsterdam, so I'm journeying from Amsterdam right now. It's about 6 p.m. Um, so, yeah. Uh, today, I want to introduce everyone to Web5 SDK uh, and also, most especially, Initialize web nodes uh, through the SDK. Uh, I currently work at TBD as the staff developer advocate, and I actually started building with Web5 myself just a little over two months ago. It's been an exciting journey of learning and stuff. So I hope I'm able to also, you know, encourage and just show people what's possible right now with the Web5 SDK. I'm going to share my screen real quick uh, and show my slides as well. One second. Right, I, I believe you can now see my screen, so. Yes, we can see it. Awesome. Yeah, so um, talking about what the web looks like today, the web itself is um, wasn't initially built to be centralized. The web was built in a way that everyone could contribute and you know, share information, connect to different sources of information and on their own data. But with the way the web has evolved back to this, to this point now, we are able to access websites from anywhere and any device, right? We are able to access websites from our PlayStation, smart fridges, if anyone has one, uh, wristwatches, mobile phones, and the likes, which is also one of the reasons myself, why I was like very super fascinated by the web, because I like to say that regardless of the innovation that comes forth, uh, the web would always have a place to, to a part to play in any, any kind of innovation that comes forth, uh, regardless of what comes. So with the web, we're able to access all of these things from anywhere. Uh, but corporate data ownership is also a very prevalent part of the web today. Uh, we have companies and such and organizations that own major parts of the web, um, including our identity, right? So today, if you look at social media platforms, email accounts, all of these forms of identities are owned by other corporations outside of ourselves. And I think that is what a lot of the organizations and foundations like DIFF itself is looking to also empower people to do, right? To own more of their own identity and more of their own data. So when we look back and see what the web was intended to be, we realize that we're a little bit far from it and it's essential for us to actually introduce an identity layer and a, and, a, and a way for users, the general users, to be able to own their own data. So what is Web5? Uh, I'm jumping right into it because we have a bunch to cover today. So Web5 itself is a sort of synchronization between the best parts of the Web2 as we know it today, and of course Web3 uh, and a decentralized layer of it. Uh, we are combining web, the best parts of Web2 and Web3, which is why we call it Web5. Uh, it's a new layer for the web that allows people to build decentralized apps and protocols. First, to do this, we have like the Web5 JS SDK. 
that empowers people to just combine a bunch of things to be able to build web applications straight up. And I'll be showing you what that entails uh, today. So in simple, in simple terms, Web5 is a digitalized platform that allows users to own their own data and identity and be able to reuse this information across any platform of their own choice. That is what the Web5 SDK enables us to do. So to go for the core pillars of Web5, especially if you're hearing about Web5 for the first time, are three. Um, we have the decentralized identifiers, which I'm assuming a lot of people are already familiar with. Uh, this allows us to own our own identities on the web. Uh, they are W3 standard, self-owned, and leaks us to our own information. Uh, it follows a certain path where the first three letters are DID, which is the scheme itself, so in indicating that uh, this string is a DID. Um, and we also have the DID method. The DID method varies across different platforms, different organizations, and how they have chosen to implement the DID itself. So this is the DID method. Uh, for the Web5 SDK, I think for the most part, we use ION, uh, although we are also exploring other modes at the moment. And then you have at the final section, the DID method specific string. Uh, this is the unique key that's in, that identifies different people, entities, uh, and objects as the case may be. So the second, oh yeah, nice. So the DID is definitely points to the DID document. And uh, this is what houses the information and can be stored even on like IPFS or digitalized storage devices uh, across the world. So the second pillar is verifiable credentials. This allows you to, con to process trustless claims and verify that these claims are indeed legit and uh, what the user has said it is. For an, ex for an example, imagine Alice is applying uh, for a loan, right? And the bank that she wants to apply the loan from is issuing a verifiable credential to her, like, hey, do you actually own this amount of money or this is proof that you own this amount of money? And then Alice is able to show uh, this verifiable credential to another lender, even on the bank itself, to prove that, yes, what I say is actually what it is, right? I'm able to confirm this through verifiable credentials and the VCs that have been digitally signed and crypto cryptographically signed as well. So the third part, which is also one of the things that we'll be focusing on, and I think it's also one of the, is the major challenge that we are providing for this hackathon, the DEF hackathon, uh, which is to encourage as many people as possible to build and be innovative with the decentralized web nodes. So what are decentralized web nodes? These are data stores for decentralized web apps. They serve as, an, as a protocol and a platform for people to store data on their own end and have it decentralized across board. So they can hold both public and encrypted data and can be hosted anywhere. Uh, the way the DWNs have been implemented, especially through Web5, is that users have a local DWN um, that is initiated through the agent. Could be a browser, could be a mobile device, a laptop, whatever the case is. And also like a remote DWN that can be hosted anywhere or across multiple devices. And there can be a synchronization across all of these decentralized web nodes. So just to make it clear as well, the decentralized web nodes do not live on the blockchain because only the TIDs do. The decentralized IDs stay on the blockchain and then they're used to identify information, especially when they are linked to the DID document to process information and identify what the DID is supposed to link to. So yeah, like I, like I explained earlier, the, the decentralized web nodes can be split into like, you can have data that is stored that is public and you can have data that is stored that is encrypted. And it's, it's an example of this is a web app that is decentralized and wants to access uh, Alice's DWN instance. Alice in this case is a decentralized web user and she has data that is stored both locally and remote and the web app can be accessed both of these local, uh, both of these uh, DWN instances either local or remote to be able to process and you know access information that she has given permission to. So an overview of this is that we have these three core pillars that power Web5 itself, and all of these are combined into what we call the Web5 JS SDK. Going over it again, we have decentralized identifiers, they are self-owned identifiers that enable decentralized identity, authentication, and routing across our mobile apps. Then we have the verifiable credentials that are formats and models that ensure that claims are actually verified and are what they are. And then we have the digitalized web nodes again, that are data storage and data stores that allows message, re that message relay nodes that serve as the foundation for all of the digitalized apps and protocols. So a question I get often is, what is the difference between a digitalized web app and a PWA? Uh, if you look at the image on the screen, uh, with the PWAs, you have like a service worker that is right between, and this still connects on most times to centralized app servers or local caches uh, that is then used to process information or keep information available offline. But with DWAs, there is the DWN SDK, which is also a part of our Web5 SDK, excuse me. 
that host is that host and keeps the data local and also decentralized decentralized that is unique to the specific person. So that is the major difference with the PWAs and DW and the DWA. So uh, I think we're getting to a point where you can also be PWAs as a decentralized web app, right? So why should you be excited about all of these things? Um, Data and identity becomes owned and decoupled and can be transferred across multiple applications. So you think of a scenario where you have uniform data across, you have a, you have a music platform that is decentralized and you own your own data, you own your data about playlists, you own your data about the music you like, and you are able to move this information, this playlist, this, this uh, data around songs to another platform entirely without any cost, right? Because it is your data, it is your information. You should be able to do this, right? So your data, your identity, all of these things is decoupled from the specific application that you are, that, that you are currently tied to because you can move it anywhere else. Also, friction of onboarding is smooth. Uh, like I said, if I'm having to sign up on a new website with information that I already have access to, that is already mine, my name, uh, my email, all of those things, right? They are mine, they are stored on my DWN already. I can easily move to a similar platform I just you know, get a very smooth onboarding experience because I've already created or stored a lot of this personal information already on my DWN and I can move this information across board. With this, Web5 allows users, especially developers, to focus on building a very unique experience uh, for users because the users will always bring their own data. Uh, so you can have multiple, for example, you can have multiple music streaming platforms that, are not, that do not necessarily have to worry about how data is stored but how the experience is for the users because users then get to bring their own data thanks to the DWN. So a few example applications, I mentioned, I mentioned the one about like universal music playlists. That is like one of the very personal and exciting one for me because I want to be able to move uh, my songs across you no know, platforms. But universal music playlist is one example. We also have connected travel, which is, um, for example, if you're flying across multiple countries, for example, and you want to be able to, have information about your flights, your hotels, your reservation, taxi, and all of these organizations want to be able to you know, have a very seamless experience for you. So the hotel can know when your flight is delayed, uh, they can know when your flight has landed, when the taxi will be picking you up, or because you've chosen to share this information with them because you've given them that access, right? And this is also very possible with digitalized data and digitalized web notes as well. Another example is holistic health experiences. Uh, Angie is one of my manager at uh, TBD. He's also a developer advocate. He's very passionate about this one because if you're moving countries and you are able to take along your health data, you're able to take along data from one um, health service to another platform, then that makes the entire experience as unique as possible for you. You do not have to go all over the, the process of, hey, this is the information I have on this previous hospital. Do you want to call, call them to confirm? Do you want to call them to request information? This information is yours. It's very, very personal to you. And I think it's very important that we are also able to own that information, own that data, and be able to reuse it where we need to. And this digitalized web nodes and the Web5 enables this to be possible. And that thing is the final financial solutions. Please note that, like, um, these are just example applications. You are not in any way limited to building any of these things. They are just examples that we've seen or that we've also imagined that Web5 can come to life and people can use to build stuff. But the potential is absolutely limitless. Uh, with financial solutions, we with Web5 enables, digitalized web enables people to be able to build and escape the limitations of the current financial system. Uh, you're able to use open protocols to enable financial transactions across borders and across platforms. And you can check out the TBDX white paper, which is one of the platforms that we are also building at TBD uh, to be able to empower financial uh, ownership across board. So these are just a few uh, examples. Check in chat real quick if there are any questions. So there's a quick question about if the DWN was data only or the DWA business logic as well. So your business logic um, stays which you stays as part of the code that you're writing, code that you're building, the DWN only owes the data or anything that you've chosen to store in the data store, right? Uh, so one way I like to describe it is that looking at the experience of how we build Web2 applications today, which is of course like our HTML, CSS, JavaScript as the case may be, Web5 replaces the API requests that we have to make um, to, this, to the central server, right, to the database, because all of the, all of the user-facing um, code, the user-facing experience, it's still the same thing. So I still build with Nox, I build with you know, React as the case may be, I write all of my business logic. Uh, but when it comes to interacting with like the data itself, where I'm storing it, that is when the Web5 SDK comes in, that's when DWN comes in 
and you're able to store data in the GWNs of the users. But when it comes to like the user experience itself, the front-end facing stuff still stays the same. You build your apps the same way you build them. I have an example here that will show you as well that is building Nuxt, which just shows that whether you're building with what's it called with vanilla JavaScript or you're using modern frameworks, everything still works the same. But when it gets to how you interact with users data, that's when the web five uh, and the WN coming. Uh, we have a few more questions. How feasible or possible would it be to store and resolve NFTs and TWNs? Um, I haven't explored the angle of NFT, so I can't completely answer that. But I think as long as you can store, it's still a personal data store and can be accessed uh, from who we give permission to. Uh, but I don't know what the technical, I'm not sure, but I think you can ask in our Discord to see how NFTs and DWNs can work better together. Does DWN require any specific format of data for storage or format agnostic? Uh, as at the moment, um, just reading the questions. All right. Um, so does it ever require any specific format of data for storage or format agnostic? Uh, at the moment, it does. Uh, we have a bunch of data formats that are supported. You can upload your blobs, text, um, JSON, uh, images as the like, media. Um, all of them are supported by, by DWNs. And I would show that with the links I will share today. Uh, someone mentions the skipping to the code part because uh, I've gone over fundamental many times. Okay, I'll do that a little bit quicker. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, would data not be scored by application? I would authorize a new health provider to access my medical records, for example. Uh, yes, data could be scored by application because you have to enforce or show that this this, this application is following a specific set of data. Uh, we call that protocols and I'll get to that right now. Uh, thank you for pointing out that you guys have gone over fundamentals already. So I'm just gonna, of course, like be quicker with and get straight to the to the code itself. Yeah, so bidding for Web5, um, we get to use the Web5 SDK in this case. And to use this, uh, you can use the npm install at web5 slash API. And this basically installs web5 SDK for you. It's as easy as that. All you have to do is also enable, uh, what's it called, type to module so that the components can be used quicker. So the web, the web5 SDK is under active development. Um, so you can already use it to build, but it is in technical preview. So there are changes that are currently being developed. We're also observing things that features that are going to be like introduced at a later time. But it's under active development, and we haven't released like the, of course the the first version like the V1 yet. So it's but it's already available for use, which is one of the reasons why we are encouraging people to build uh, with this solution right now for the hackathon, and people can start to you know experience that and give feedback as well. So um, let's see. This is how you can basically install the Web5 SDK to your project, and we're gonna explore a next project like a build just to show you guys. What is possible? Uh, this is a project. This is a Nox project that is used to track favorite songs. It's um, very simple and shows uh, how you can carry out crude operations with Web5 SDK, which is create, read, update, and delete. Right. Um, so what we want to build is an app that actually stores. Okay, Lemari. Um, uh, so just um, so I'm sorry. I'm just in the background here. Just. Okay. Just want to reiterate that the I know a lot of people are advanced, but there are some people and in the hackathon that are new to decentralized identity. So we welcome all the new concepts, and we also welcome you know the code and and getting into the more advanced concepts. So I just want to I just want to state that. So yeah, do you go want ahead. me to go back and explain some of the things I skipped a bit? Um, so I well um I guess we'll just ask the room. Um does does anybody um want to go further into the fundamentals before we go more into the code and the implementation? Okay. Okay, so I think we're good to go forward, Atawala, but I just wanted to make sure people are yeah. aware there are gonna be people coming along that are that are brand new and, and might not be as advanced as others are during this hackathon. So, okay, but go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, so basically, I think we have other questions real quick. Is there a way the digitalized application can verify that users publish some data on their digitalized web node? <clears throat> Excuse me. In a way that it can trust that this is visible? Um, I, I believe so. Um, I would show, I think I'll show that with this example because um, you can set how much 
access you want people to you know to read your GWN. You can set which data is public and you can set which data is encrypted. Uh, and that way, other uh, other decentralized apps can choose if they are able to read that or not, basically. Excuse me. Right. Um, so what do we want to build? We want to build an app that stores and displays information about the user's favorite songs. So I'm able to add the title of the song, who, who the artists that created it, and of course, then uses a third-party API from last FM to get like the cover art, right? That's the application I'm going over a little bit. Uh, so to do this, we're gonna be using, of course, the DW instead of Web5 SDK. So the first thing we're gonna do is to import the SDK. Um, and I'm gonna just switch my screen sharing to my code a bit. One second. Let me see if I can share the desktop itself. One second, please. Right. Oops. Let me just stop here. Okay, share screen. Share desktop. All right. So we. So we have this. Uh, we have the up the view. Um. One second. Zoom in. Too much. <laughs> So this is a Noxt application that uses um, the Web5 SDK uh, to build a very simple application. Uh, I think I have the, yes, like this. Uh, the image is also as, as described here on the slide. Uh, this is the final result. Uh, let me just refresh real quick and show you as well the console.log. So step-by-step step, we have, um, we have our UI here, which is basically the same as every other Nox application that, that we develop, right? Um, we are designing this with our HTML, CSS, as case may be. You can build any application in any way, in that way. Uh, then when it gets to the point where you want to start connecting and you want to start accessing data, storing it, creating it, uh, the Web5 SDK comes into that place. So we have um, our import here. Please let me know if you can see this, the text where I can zoom in a little bit more. Uh, just not sure how, excuse me. Yeah, just not sure how, how much the zoom is. But yeah, so we have our import. Did I just? <laughs> right. <laughs> so we have our import here that allows us to import Web5 uh, from the installed API, from the installed Web5 SDK. And we have a bunch of variables here that follow the same you know, JavaScript con um, concept that we normally use. Now, what's important here is our connect. Um, we do this in our own before map because we want the connection to the Web5 SDK to happen as soon as the app is loaded. Uh, and with this, we are able to create a Web5 object and a Web5 instance and also keep track of our DIDs. So if we go back to the to the page, you would see here. Uh, let me refresh, refresh real quick because I made a mistake. Uh, we have questions. Zoom. Okay, gotcha. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to zoom this as well. So it's clear, right? So yeah, in our application, the first thing that happens, let me refresh again. First thing that happens is we check if the user currently has any songs already stored in their DWN. And that is done with the code, excuse me. So basically we connect to the DIDs on our web five and yeah, we are fetching or in a query, which is basically like we'll do with any other service that we have, any other database that we have. Uh, to check if there are existing um, records that match the schema that we have here, which is the schema that shows this is a music recording, right? So you can have multiple applications, uh, Spotify, Tidal, whatever the case is, that also follow the same schema uh, to say, oh, these are, this is how they are storing individual music recording items, individual music recording records uh, in your DWNs for you to fetch all of this information, right? Um, so we check this out and we query it to find out if there are existing records or not. And if you go back to the page, you see this is the DID, which is our unique identifier. I hope this is clear. I mean, this is also the Web5 instance. And we, we are logging to the, to the console to show that we don't have any existing, what's it called, any existing songs added. Um, so I don't know if anyone in chat is quick enough, you can give me a song to add, uh, but I could also just add a bunch. Yeah, Michael Jackson, song alone. Bonaboy, 
need to uh, okay so once i do all of this uh now add the songs oh, i have an error here process technique sorry at the private key of state the user the id is stored inside the wn uh yes the 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 did itself the private key did is connected to the agent and also, of course the dwn on your local on your local device uh there's a error here real quick i'm gonna fix this with uh an import here from browser sorry uh, let me refresh real quick gotcha so I have to do that again real quick. Uh, Michael Jackson, song title, say, right. So once I click on add songs, um, you can see almost instantly affects the API from last FM for the cover ads, uh, for all of them. And I also have the record stored here. Yeah? I'm gonna refresh again, just to show you how data is fetched. And now it's also like, um, what's it called? <laughs> yeah, so you can see the saved records. Um, also, just here, um, we have the DID of the person that created of the author of the target, which is ourselves, because all of this is happening on our own DWN locally. Uh, but it's also a sync with the remote DWN. So if you go, uh, if you're on that device, you're able to sync this data across your devices because you have a remote DWN that enables all of that. I'm going to go to the code a bit. I just wanted to show us what the UI looked like and how it worked. So yeah, what we have here is basically for the process, we fetch, uh, we connect to the Web5 SDK uh, and we have our Web5 instance and our DID. And then we check each record that we have existing or if we want to add a new one. We are using Last.fm uh, API with our public with our API key to check and get the, the album art, right? which is exactly what happened there. Um, and then adding, adding a bunch of songs, we have a different function for that. I want to reemphasize again that a lot of the operations that happen in this kind of application is still like everyday application that we already build. Um, what changes is when we start to make interactions with the data store, and that is where um, DWNs come in. So where did I put the metadata for those tracks? The metadata uh, is pulled from, what was it called? Is in this function, get cover ad. I feel like I should zoom in one more time just so everyone sees. So get cover ad is basically me fetching the cover ad from last FM API. So the reason this is here is also to show you that you can connect with any third party services to do all of this, right? It doesn't have to be a web application. You can use any other API. You can build you can build your web apps the same way you build them today, except that your data is digitalized and you're using the Web5 SDK to enable that. Uh, so do you have a question? Yeah, uh -huh. um, just a question to you, Adewala. There are yes. various questions coming in the chat. Do you prefer to go through the rest of your demo first and then take the questions or do you want to take the questions as they come up? Uh, I am doing that already. Uh, if I missed any, you can let me know, but I could just alternate between them so that I don't like go far before answering the questions. There's, um, there's a couple that came in um, that, let me see here, uh, about... I think there's one that just came in. Where did you just pull the metadata for those tracks? Did, did you answer that one? Yeah, that's what the person said. Cool. Oh, okay. I just did. Okay. No problem. <laughs> yeah. I have it open on the side, so I'll just answer when I can and just uh, alternate. But it's fine. Um, so the user agent passes data from the user as WN and passes to the web server. So all of this is happening client side. Um, the, the WN storage is client side. Um, so your agent locally is able to do this, especially if you are offline or whatever the case is, but you also have a remote WN that you can see data across. So in this case is that the page is directly through the SDK accessing the WN. The agent is right there between the, the web browser and the, the DWN, right? So you don't have to like worry about the web server. This is almost completely serverless, if that makes sense. <laughs> to clarify, the user's DID is persisted across different applications. Uh, and that is so that different applications can have access to the same data. Uh, no, so your DWN is what is persisted because it's unique to your to your device. It's unique to, um, you have a DWN, but you can have multiple DWNs, but they are unique and they are persistent, right? Uh, so whatever application that comes in has access to that decentralized web node, uh, the DID itself is the identifier and not the not the web node itself, if that makes sense. But yeah, let's... let's um, 
Uh, let's go back to the to the presentation, I think. Yep. Uh, so we have this. Um, I kind of had another song. I'm trying to think of a song right now. Oh, let's see, Overwhelming. Uh, Jambelion. The song, and we have it right here as well. Uh, so this this is a simple application that we built all around our DWN, and it's persistent. I can refresh, I can do all of that stuff. Uh, and also, it's if there are multiple example applications like this that we have on the developer documentation here at TBD. Uh, let me show you real quick. Yeah, so we have um we have a chat application, we have a to do application, we have a share to do app that is peer to peer between multiple people. So you guys are sharing your DIDs and your DWNs across uh, together. We have a book review stuff that you can also check out and you know just figure out how you could get snippets to work together in this case. But I'm just going with something as simple as possible, and I'll go back to the presentation quickly just to show you what's possible as well. How can I obtain the same DID generated by DWN in different devices or applications? Um, so your DID is, is unique to device, right? At that particular point in time, because the DID identifies that device. So if I'm having, for example, two different browser types, uh, which they're going to uh, two different browsers, like for example, a Microsoft Edge or a Google Chrome, excuse me, those are going to be different DIDs. Uh, but then as the, the eventual goal is that you're able to track all of the DIDs that belong to you, either on a of course on a user profile device or somewhere, right? And all of these DIDs are, can be connected to the same DWN if your DID document is updated uh, to points to that decentralized web node. Uh, so the decentralized web node can be exactly like an ID wallet, but the decentralized the decentralized web node can be the same across board, like they're syncing the data is shared across board almost basically automatically. So you don't have to like replicate or manually replicate your data across multiple DWNs, but you can have multiple DIDs that stand for different things. DIDs can, DIDs can point to a person, an organization, a school, a thing, uh, a device, as the case may be, they are, they are simply identifiers. But what they point to is what is important. And in this case, the, the decentralized web node uh, asks all of this data. So we have another question, what is the web five? instance the web five instance happens right in the application uh which is also through your local agent uh so for example if i'm opening this up in a in a browser here yeah, like i did here yeah, my web five instance right here which is this is right on my device right in this browser as we are currently using for the application it's client side uh like i explained so this happens all in your browser even if it's your phone you open the same application with it's the same thing happens, right? So if you look at the web object, you find the agent, DID, DWN, and the VCs, which is like the major pillars I described earlier. So all of this agent and the instance of the web five happens right in the in the device that you're using for it. Um, yeah, let's go back to the slides. So yeah, I already explained what the how the connect happens. You get the age, you get the web five instance, and you also get the the DIDs. So all the operations that you carry out, like for example, adding a new song. Uh, we are able to follow the schema for each song so that multiple applications can follow the same the same set of data so that the data can be consistent and reusable across multiple applications. Uh, so this is what we call schemas and you can use any type of schema as long as if any other person is within that same a similar application like related application, they're able to use the schema to identify data structure. So storing our data, uh, we are using the web five, our web five instance to then through the DWN create a new record. Um, using our song data, the schema, and of course, identifying the data format. So could the DWN also be in the cloud? What if an application server wants to save data to users DWN while they are offline? Yes. Um, so like I explained right now, while we're in technical preview, um, a user has a local DWN, a local DWN uh, which is, could be their browser, could be their mobile phone, but they also have a remote DWN that is currently hosted by TBD, just temporarily, uh, but as, as we go, as we launch, or should I have as go public if that's the word for it? Um, users can host their own DWN anywhere they want it to be. Uh, they can host it privately, they can host it on a centralized server if they want to, but it just the point is to give users the control of where they want their data to be. Uh, so you DWNs can be in the cloud, but they can always be synced across all of your DWN. So you can have a DWN, a local DWN, you have a remote DWN, and you sync this data across board. Um, a lot of this information is also available in our documentation. Uh, there's something around syncs, uh, which basically allows you to possess. Let me zoom in a bit. 
allows you to possess multiple DWNs that you can then sync across both. Right. So that I think that answers your question, Austin. Uh, going back here. Yes, so a lot of, all of these methods are available in the Web5 instance under the DWN. Uh, so for us to create a new song, uh, we go web5.dwn.records.create and we are able to um, create a new song following this data structure, our data, which is what is the information we want to store. Uh, the, and the message is like the metadata for that data. So like the schema uh, and the data format for it. And we, then we are fetching our songs. So it was like one of the first things we did because we wanted to know if there were because if it's a new application, even if I'm using the application for the first time, I'm assuming that the user has probably created some kind of record that is connected to what I'm doing. So our step is to query the person's DWN to see if they have existing data that match our schema, or in some cases, our protocol. But I'm going to explain what the protocol is uh, down the line. Um, so yeah, just like uh, explain create, create, read, update, delete, you're able to do that with the with the functions available in the instance. So we have web five, the query, we have uh deleting songs, which is records of delete. Uh, and we also have protocols. So I'm going to get back to that real quick as I answer this next question. Uh, the remote DWN server can be placed anywhere in public. Does that mean anyone can use their own DID to write data to the remote DWN server? Not anyone, uh, DWN is very much tied to the DIDs of the, of the author, as we say. Uh, so you only have permission to do that. And anyone can, anyone that, only the people that you've given access to or that you've given permissions to can write or even read from your DWN server, regardless of where you store it. Um, so that, I think that is, that is what it is. So it's not automatically accessible by anyone, any other person or their DIDs. It's very much tied to your, to the people you've given permissions to and to your own uh, author DID. Um, so this is a little bit of a, let me go back to the code real quick. So if you look at this, this is a very simple application that is also de decentralized. We're able to store songs, add songs, uh, and of course, fetch them back from the DWN and also delete them if we need to. Uh, we have more, slightly more complicated examples on the website. Um, and an example of this application, uh, let me show you guys real quick, is a shared to-do app here. Uh, what this does is allows us to build end-to-end -end, um, what's it called application where I can work with my friend that is building that is also using the same application on their own browsers on their own device but collaborate on the same to do stuff so right we are wondering how are we able to share information and keep data uh, together right um let me see if I can do an example of that so basically this is possible through protocols and I wanted to explain what protocols were because as your application starts to like you know get more advanced and you want to set permissions uh you want to set data structure, schemas, um, be, okay, this is how I have like a very huge application. That is your protocols coming. Your protocols, you're able to set who can, uh, let me see, there's a picture here. Yeah, so your protocols, you're able to set who can write, who can post. Uh, let's imagine, for example, a blog post, right? Uh, you want to store a blog, you're building a blog and you want to store this data on your, on your DWN. You want to be able to set who can write to the DWN. Uh, or a specific post, who can post a comment, who can you know reply to your comments, stuff like that. That is made possible through protocols. So it's a very interesting piece of technology that you could also you know explore to see how it you know comes handy now with the application you're trying to build. So um, I think I can drop the link as well in chat. But all of this is also available in the presentation and in my slides. I'm, I can share it out. So protocols itself, excuse me, <clears throat> allows you to define a data schema. Uh, and contract between more two or more decentralized web nodes uh, for them to agree on how to communicate and share data. So if you are building an application that requires people to, uh, what's it called? If you're building an application that requires people to communicate or share information across board and still stay de decentralized, uh, protocols come in very handy in this case. And if you look at the structure here, you have the link to the protocol itself. You choose if it is published or not. And then you set the types, which is like, oh, what are you calling? Uh, the data schemas that you have available in, in your application, all of these is declared in your protocol. Well, it's a setting the permissions to so you know who can do what. Can we compare DWNs to IPFS? Um, I do not think so. Um, IPFS is a de decentralized file storage. Uh, so it allows you to just store files like um, on this, I don't know what to call them, <laughs> but DWNs are more, um, what's it called? They are data stores and store different types of data. It could be text, could be um, media, could be images, videos, 
basically like a database. It's almost like asking, can we compare IPFS to a database? And I would say no, even though the IPFS does you know files and stuff. Uh, DWN is literally a database that is owned by every like each person, right? You can have your own did your own node locally or remote as case maybe, but it is your your database. So it's not directly like a, a file storage, even though it can be. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah. Um, so yeah, if you're building an application that requires this kind of communication, definitely check out protocols. Uh, I have the links in my slide and also drop it in chat. Uh, and yeah, um, there are a bunch of resources available. Uh, you can go to the documentation website, developer.tbd.website slash dogs. Uh, and also to find out what features are available or not, uh, there is a, uh, sorry, excuse me, uh, we web five yet to come. Yes, so you can use this to check out how much progress has been done uh, with the Fab SDK and what you need to, you know, incorporate in your application as case may be. Um, going back, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. I have a question. Any thoughts on how applications can respect the right to be forgotten and delete data created by an app, but that data is stored on the user's WN and I might want to keep it or perhaps revoke permissions. Yeah, uh, that is a very, very good question. And in my slide, I think I have at some point uh, just showing a little bit of what, what still needs to be figured out. I uh, mentioned that Web5 is in technical preview. Uh, it's open source and solutions are also being explored for all of these functions. One of it includes <clears throat> in management, but I think it's, a, what's it called? It's a general problem in the industry. Uh, and of course, data usage, which is the question that you've asked, how do we prevent abuse? Um, it's still, permissions are very important, which is one of the reasons why protocols are implemented and now you can configure who has access to your data or not. Uh, but it's still currently very difficult to to undo or how do I put this to put in check people that that you keep permissions to initially don't miss is this this permission that you're giving to them. Who is responsible for deploying or managing the WN? Is the issue as to Um, I believe the goal would be that everyone would be responsible for managing their DWN. But as time goes on, excuse me, there could be services that that are created to make sure that the experience of DWNs are um uh, what's it called. Are more user friendly. Uh, like someone mentioned in chat earlier, the use of wallets could make it very easy for you to have your DWNs local, and also host like a service could be with any any DWN provider as case maybe. Um, but I think it will require trust and knowing. But you have the full control to decide where you want your DWN to be or not. Uh, is it free to use or does it require gas like blockchains? It it is free to use. You do not require to pay, to make gas payments. Um, I didn't do a lot of Web three myself, but it doesn't require a lot of gas. You do not. Only the, the only the DID is in any way connected to blockchain using the I think the Lightning Network uh, to create your unique DID. But for example, the application I showed here is totally offline, no payment, no cost, nothing. I was able to create my DID, which is this, and run the application. So no, it doesn't. It is it is totally free to use. Do you know what is the state of the DWN draft? Have you followed the draft and then as TVD took some design choices on your own? Yeah, I believe uh, the, the DWN team itself is, of course, um, I think following the draft and I've implemented a lot of these things. Uh, let's start check Daniel, which is one of the core developers right now on the WN was in chat. I'm not sure if he's still here. Um, but yeah, um, we're not just making design choices on our own. We're following the standards that have been created by some of these bodies and making sure that um, everyone is able to use this as openly as possible. These are open standards. We are not inventing DWNs. We are not inventing DIDs as case may be. They are open standards that are very much out there and you know for people to follow and implement. Uh, going back to interoperability between applications, I would to music applications is, is a same playlist. <clears throat> it would application generate different DIDs for them and I was just different parts of the DWNs understanding. Right. So um I think a way to describe it is, uh, give me one second. There is a perfect application that could answer this. Just let me check for it real quick. Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, this is um, an application from one of my teammates here at TBD. Uh, let me see. So basically this is two different applications, right? That allows, <clears throat> That obviously they're from like two different applications entirely, but they're working with the same DWN. The DWN is unique to the user. It's your data store. It's always there regardless of the application. And your TID is also unique to you because it's your device and all of, all of this stuff. So for example, I can select a bunch of like playlists here in this application as automatically stored in the background. And if I copy my DID, 
you can see I start, I chose temple and desserts here. This is one application on its own. This is another application separately. And I enter my DID here. Um, let's see. I'm able to see the, the items I selected that is stored in my DWN. And the reason this is possible is because the protocols, like I said, the schemas, they are they match together. Um, let me go back to the code again. So for example, the protocols or with the, the data itself, if the schema is a music recording or it's a music or it's a person or it's a school, whatever the, the object is that the schema matches, your DWN is yours, your data is yours, then you're able to reuse it in every application. So the application does not worry about generating a new DID for you because they are not generating a DID for you. It's all tied to your agent, your local um, device, basically. Uh, let me go back to the browser. I hope that answers your question because that, that basically shows two different applications that are, that are using the same you know, DWN. It's larger vision that there would be a variety of providers at the end of the DWN interface and I can choose and move my I'm not sure I get a question, Otto. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, like, could I move data between, like, you know, Google and Dropbox and whoever, like, as long as they all adhere to the DWN standard? Or yeah, like... I, I think I think the way to describe it is that DWNs are consistent across the board because they are an open standard. So if if you are hosting, you you choose where you can host. If you are hosting your DWN on Dropbox, if they provide that kind of service or Google. Uh, your data is synced across both your local and your remote DWNs, right? So you can choose to delete maybe the Dropbox node, as the case may be, but your data is still available on all the other synced uh, DWNs across board. So no matter how many DWNs you have, you can choose to sync data across all of them. So it's the same data that is available. So for example, if I'm syncing, if I have data that, is, that I'm using on my laptop, but because it's synced to my Dropbox DWN, for example, and I'm on my mobile phone outside, I'm still connected to that DWN because it's my data, right? Everything is synced and I can still do stuff on it, if that makes sense. So I, it's not necessarily tied to the providers because you are the one that, it's your data. It's your DWN, if that makes sense. Got it, thank you. Yeah, Daniel responded to that, thank you. Is there a way to provide a projected DID to the Web5 SDK? Yes, there is. Um, I think once you go to the to the API reference here, there should be a, yeah, a DID here that you can connect and there are options and you can resolve. Um, all of this information uh, is, what's it called? Is in the documentation as well and you can catch up with stuff like that. But yeah, I think Daniel is also responding to some of the questions in chat, which is amazing. Thanks, Daniel. <clears throat> yep. Yeah, uh, let me, I can talk about the, there's a couple that are similar. Um, so there's, you know, someone asked about like who can write to the ones that are you know hosted outbound. Um, yeah, if you host like a DWN outbound, like let's say a large web company does for you, and you have your local instances and remote instances, the DWNs are set up to be multi-tenant, which means that one DWN instance can have millions you know of, of users on it. Obviously, the ones in your local devices only will have your own IDs data. You know, the, you, you might have like five IDs. It's only gonna have your stuff. Um, and anything that is stored within those boundaries. But the outbound ones that are hosted can be used as like a service where it's like Dropbox, you know, like Dropbox doesn't just have, they don't have like a VM for every user. They have one big service and it automatically has like account rows effectively. That's the similar way to think about DWNs is they're multi-tenant by default. So you have a big host, um, each person gets their own little slot or, or area and you can only read other people's data if they mark it as public or don't encrypt it and you know publish it effectively. So, so it's not like you know free for all. In fact, like you, um, if if something was inserted, the way that DWNs are designed is if someone tried to insert data in like Alice's remote that shouldn't be there according to the permissions that are required and all these other things, her her local um, node will reject those things. It's sort of like a blockchain. I mean, it's not really a blockchain in any way in, in the same technical sense, but it, that characteristic of like tamper um, evasiveness is something that they have where like, you can't just, you know, mess with someone's state and then that that's it. It's they're self-proving if that makes sense. Thanks Daniel. Uh, I don't know if there are any more questions.
Are you there, Lamari? I'm here. Yeah. Did awesome. uh, did you get to that last question from Tovis? Oh, uh, check in real quick. If I had an hierarchical DB stored on blockchain. Uh, do you want to take that, uh, Daniel? <laughs> oh, okay. So that's from, wh which one is this? Which? Uh, Tobes, I think is a... So if I had a hierarchical DB yeah. stored on blockchain, could I use DDBNs for redundancy? Um, I mean, you can you can use DWNs for whatever you want. I mean, they're they're a data store. They don't they don't have any limitations on file types. Um, the data that they store could be large scale data. We've tested tens of gigabytes. You could host Blu-ray movies out of them. You could do whatever you want. So um, it's not limited to credentials or any, anything really. I mean, they they they're made to be an application data store. I would think of them more as like a more decentralized personal version of like Google's Firebase. Is probably a good way to think of it. That's probably the closest corollary you're going to find is like you took Firebase and made it like a eventually strongly consistent multi-device sync data store for apps that they could ask for access and you know be able to store their data with you. Um, that's really what they are. Um, if you think about them that way. And um, I know that there's a couple more questions in the chat um, that we can get to, but we will, uh, looking at the time, we do have just three minutes left. So whatever we can we can get in those three minutes is very good. Let's see um, what we have here. So there's one question about pairing a smart contract account EOA to a Dawn? Um, when you say pairing, so I mean like DWNs, you know, they're, you can write anything to them, you know, like if you had, you know, if you're using some sort of blockchain system or want to have off-chain data, you can certainly do that. Um, there's no like special connection between the two uh, in the sense that, you know, you, you would just write whatever data you wanted. If it happened to be about a smart contract or something of that nature, or you wanted to do that you could um like a smart contract account I, I guess it depends like you have to use a did that's one of the requirements to write to a DWN. you have to use a did so um when you say smart contract account hopefully that can be represented as a did maybe it's a ethereum key or something and it's going to be a you know key that you can use did key for instance and get your you know have a dwn that maps to the same did key i, I don't know the specifics of the use case but you know, certainly you can store that type of data in there. Okay, thank you. Um, there's another question. Um, the remote DWN server can be placed anywhere in public. Does that mean anyone can use their own DID to write the data to the remote DWN server? Yeah, for their, their little section of that remote, right? If they're hosting themselves, they might not add any other tenants, DIDs, to it if it's a big giant company and there's going to be a very very large company running these for free by the way at scale it's the announcements coming in january um that will host it for millions of people then yeah you'll be able to get an, like a quote unquote account there but basically an instance there and then your locals will sync to it um you'll be able to write to it anyone you give permission can write to it um that sort of thing okay All right, so we have um, just um, under a minute here, but unfortunately I do have to hop to another session. Um, so I'm going to have to end this one before I hop to that one. Um, there are a couple more questions in the chat, but I encourage you to head over to Discord to ask those questions. Adewala will be around as well as um, the other developer advocate um, at TBD. So I do want to thank everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much, Adewala. That was a great presentation. And mm -hmm. there were awesome questions uh, from the room. And please join us to continue the discussion in Discord. I dropped the, the link in the chat earlier. If someone has that handy, you can go ahead and drop that now. Um, also, if you're planning on joining us um, for the next se section, um, I'm going to uh, drop the zoom link in here because um people had some trouble with eventbrite earlier let me see if that works so if you want to copy that over and just come on it's a polygon id session 
that we're going to have with Otto Mora, who was just on here a moment ago. If you want to learn more about Polygon ID and their challenge, um, hop on over to that session. So uh, thank you, everyone. And I hope you have a wonderful day or evening. Right. See you guys around. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank you.